Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is part of a, a very long chapter in this larger book I, I'm writing. I've got more about 20,000 words, so I've had to really summarize lots of the chapter. One thing I should say is that I'm not going to be talking about how people such as Ibn Arabi and Rumi idealize the divine feminine. Okay? I'm much more interested in the position of Sufis or Sufi women, if we can talk about such a thing, on the ground itself. Okay, so, but we can perhaps talk about the idealization, idealization of divine feminine in the section for questions after the presentation. Okay. So one of the most striking features of the 10th to 13th century in the Persianate world is the virtual absence of well-known females among the ranks of famous Sufi authors. We can ask lots of questions. Why is it that there are no writings by female Sufis from this period? What is known about female Sufis how common are they in, in their daily lives in, in Sufi texts? Well, it's obvious that there's something interesting happening in the respect that when you look at texts, when you look at hagiographies, when you look at Sufi manuals, there's evidence of female Sufi activity. What we do not find, however, are the names of these females. And we don't get writings of these females. Okay? One of the most typical examples that I can give you relating to this concerns the, the literature, the genre of the Tabagat. Okay, so here you have a list of the very famous Tabagat literature, Sulami, Abu Nuaym, Hujuri, Usheri, Ansari, Ibn Jawzi, and Attar. Sulami is interesting, of course, because in his very, very large and thick work, The Generation of Male Sufis, Tabagat al Sufia, they're all men. Okay, very large book, okay, covering a whole range of, of uh, very spiritual uh, individuals until Sulami's own time. However, let's not castigate him too much because he does have a very smaller book, a smaller book uh, about worshipping Sufi women in which he includes anecdotes and stories about 82 individuals who are women, of course. But these are very, very short, maybe a paragraph in length, whereas his entries for, for the males in his male book, if you like, extend to maybe five, six, seven pages of text. So anyway, we're off to a, a relatively good start with Sulami. When we turn to our, our next examples, well, it's pretty dire. Abu Nuaym has absolutely zero, no female entries in his work. Hujwari, in his Kashul Majub, has quite a large chapter looking at uh, the history of, of Sufis, and he has no female entries. And likewise, we can castigate Bushairi, who has absolutely no, no female Sufis either. And likewise, Ansari, who has none in his 274 entries. Things get better, however, in the 12th, 13th century with these last two entries. You have Ibn Jawzi, who has 25% of his 200 entries are devoted to females. The problem, however, with Ibn Jawzi is that many, many of these are the female relatives of the Prophet and or unnamed women who occupy maybe four or five lines. So again, it's very, very brief. And then finally, we come to Attar, whose uh, Tazkirat al has one entry amongst the 72 entries. Let's look a bit more on Attar. So one of the most significant works of, these, uh, of the Tabakat genre is Attar, whose Tazkirat al was probably composed around the beginning of the 13th century and is divided into 72 remembrances, each one presenting a life of a Sufi. One of these chapters is devoted to Rabia who died around 801. Rabi, of course, is an iconic female Sufi who became and continues to be a paragon of female Sufis who perform miracles, taught that love for God was more important than desire for a heavenly reward or fear of hellish chastisement, and she instructed eminent males in her time. In his first paragraph in his chapter on Rabia, Attar stated, there he is, if anyone asks why we place remembrance of her among the ranks of men, we reply that the master of the prophets declares, God does not regard your forms. It is not a matter of form, but of right intention. If it is right to derive two thirds of religion from Aisha, then it is also right to derive benefit from one of his maidservants. When a woman is a man on the path of the Lord Most High, she cannot be called a woman. So. It's possible to understand Attar's last sentence when a man, sorry, when a woman is a man on the path of the Lord in two ways. In the first view, 
we must read his, his, his words in conjunction with the hadith that he cited, God does not regard your forms. In effect, it is not that a woman must become male. Rather, it is at high levels of spirituality that individuals also achieve human perfection. In other words, the word man signifies human rather than a gendered term, an argument advanced by um, Anne-Marie Schimmel. The second understanding reflects a perspective that is typified in an argument offered by the American scholar, Laurie Silvers. And she argues that statements such as uh, attars are render, render rabia sexually neuter and denies them their sexual availability, i.e. making them safe. They transcend any notion of sex and therefore they become individuals on the path of God equal with male Sufis. Moreover, Silvers considers dangerous the praise of calling women men. This is because when men vouch for women's exceptional status by rendering them sexually neuter, depicting them as having transcended their bodies or by calling them men, their praise only confirms that men hold the power to authorize women's value and women on the whole were perceived typically as spiritually and morally weak. Despite this reservation from Lovey Silvers on Adar's comments, his presentation of Rabia must certainly have challenged some patriarchal ideas. Transcending sexuality and the parameters of what most females in Islamic society could expect in daily practical life, Rabia is celebrated as a Sufi whose sole concern was devotion to God. And this led her to adopt a celibate lifestyle, thereby positioning herself outside of the restrictions that needed to be enforced for the segregation between mahram and non-mahram. This explains for the declaration of Hassan al-Basri, who was understood as one of the major forefathers of the Sufi tradition, that he discoursed with her the whole night and did not notice that he was a man or that she was a woman. It is also worthwhile to point out, as many have done, that Rabia is depicted by Attar as the teacher and spiritual mentor of Hassan al-Basri. This contrast between Rabia and Hassan al-Basri occurs not in a single anecdote, but rather in a chain of over 10 episodes, during which she instructs other leading Sufis, including Shaqiq al-Balqi, Ibrahim Atham, and Malik al-Dinar. The idealization of Rabia in Attar's work of 72 great individuals suggests that her way of celibacy, her refusal to marry, and her rejection of all worldly concerns made up the sole path of female spirituality. For many women, however, the model of Islamic spirituality was provided by Muhammad's wives and daughters, which was that of mother and wife, and as such did not necessarily preclude a spiritual, perhaps a Sufi lifestyle. Moreover, her celibacy and denial of any sexual inclination should be contrasted with the way that male Sufis are often presented. For example, the celebrated Junaid of Baghdad, who died in 910, is reported to have remarked, I need sex as much as I need food. <coughs> the later Sufi tradition, especially as represented by Ibn Arabi, gave theoretical answers for the, for the necessity of marriage in which sexual relations between the spouses nurtured the ultimate experience of the divine. Attar's idealization of Rabia ignored different types of female spirituality, although Sufis would have been aware that diversity had existed in the tradition. For example, Sulami's works on pious believing women included females who were married and those who were mothers. But the difficulties encountered by women should not be overlooked and help to explain the reason behind the apparently greater number of pious men that were discussed by the earliest biographers. While as much Sufi literature simply ignored other kinds of female Sufi models, the idealized Rabia became the prominent female trope to express the desired qualities in Sufi females. So that's the first um, section looking at the, the, the tabaka genre. Move now to the Sufi manuals. So aside from the Tabagat literature, there are other works by Sufis that contain their views about women, especially in the treatises of the early and classical authors that discuss the benefits and disadvantages of celibacy and marriage. One of the very earliest manuals is that of Abul Nas Saraj, who died in 988, whose Kitab al-Luma fil Tasawwuf, Book of Light Flashes, 
does not contain any section that is devoted to women, but it includes a chapter entitled The Rules of Married Men and Those Who Have Children. Saraj does not directly convey his own opinion. Instead, he speaks through the words of past masters. But it's clear that his main concern is not women per se, but the distractions that women and children may cause. A contrast to Saraj's work is The Nourishment of Hearts, Guta Qulub, composed by Abu Talab al-Maki, who died in 996, who has been characterized as, and I quote, a profound misogynist by uh, a Cambridge PhD thesis by Iman Kamper. He had an extremely negative view of women to the extent that he argued in favor of a celibate life because he disliked women and regarded the benefits of divorce as greater than the advantages of a couple remaining together. Naturally, Maki could not deny the prophetic model of marriage. However, he argued that women in the prophet's time were more pious, helpful, and supportive, whereas in his own lifetime, the morals of women had deteriorated as their demands had increased. Another Sufi who composed a manual for aspiring dervishes, and which also discussed celibacy and marriage, was Hijwuri, who died in 1072, whose Kash al Mahjub famously is one of the earliest Persian Sufi texts. Hujwiri displayed considerable ambivalence about the advantages of marriage. He seems to have favoured celibacy over marriage, despite having been married himself, or even because he, or even because he had been married, maybe. And remarked, Sufism was founded on celibacy. The introduction of marriage brought about a change. But he offered advice to those who were married, and he says, and I quote, the husband should be kind to his wife and should provide her with legal expenses, sorry, with lawful expenses. Nevertheless, there are passages which betray a blatant disregard for women and their welfare. He says, and again I quote, in our times, it is impossible for anyone to have a suitable wife whose wants are not excessive and whose demands are not unreasonable. Sounds very modern. In the generation after Hujwiri, Abu Hamad al-Ghazali discussed women in a far more detailed and sophisticated manner than Saraj or Hujwiri. His Adab al-Nikah, contained in his magnus opus, the uh, magnum opus, his Ihya al um, contains a lot of information about his perspectives on these uh, kind of gender relations. From the outset, it should be remembered that the work was penned primar primarily for a male readership. All the issues raised are specific to the male perspective, based upon the assumption that men have authority over their wives, reflecting the Quranic in injunction of uh, chapter 4, verse 34, that men are in charge of women. Like other Muslims of his time, Ghazali endorsed the complementarity of the sexes in terms of their social functions and jobs. Thus, Ghazali describes the benefits to males in marriage, such as allowing the husband freedom from concern with the running of the household and all the chores of cooking, making beds, cleaning dishes, and preparing meals. But men also uh, enjoy the benefits from enduring women's temper, bearing the pain they cause, endeavoring to reform them, and guide them on the path of religion. Ghazali's misogyny has been discussed by Fatima Manissi, who witnesses in Ghazali a correlation between controlled female sexuality and social order. Female sexuality is regulated by both segregation and polygamy, which enhance male domination, and also by regular and sufficient sexual activity that satisfies the female. Menissi understands Ghazali as positing, and I quote from her, the woman as hunter and the man as the hunted passive victim. And her investigation also highlights Ghazali's discussion of how women have, and again I quote, the power to deceive and defeat men not by force, but by cunning and intrigue. It's true that Manis's views have not received universal acceptance. And while the background to Ghazali's views on women is obviously complex and devise simple answers, it does appear to be the case that many Muslims came to equate females with sexuality, emotion, and irrationality, and males with reason, the intellect, and devout spirituality. Ghazali himself suggests that the difference between the sexes is based on scriptural foundation 
and he cited the hadith that women are deficient in intelligence and confirmed that this particular hadith referred to the Quranic verse that the testimony of two women is equal to the witness of just one man. It appears that Ghazali was concerned with upholding male honour. And one method to achieve this was to control and to use women in marriage in order to consolidate or advance within society. He warns his readers, the prosperity and peopling of the world depend on women. True prosperity, however, will not be achieved without sound planning. It is men's duty, especially after coming of age, to take precautions in matter of choosing wives and giving daughters in marriage, and so avoid falling into disgrace and embarrassment. It is a fact that all the trials, misfortunes and woes which befall men come from women, and that few men get in the end what they long for and hope for from them. Perhaps the most influential Sufi after Ghazali's Ehya al was Abu Hafsu Masofaradi's Awaref al Ma'aref, in which there was a chapter with a heading, Celibates and Married Men. It is evident that Sofaradi was well acquainted with Ghazali's works, as he cites many of the same ahadith and sayings of Sufi masters, although it is a much shorter and not so well structured part of his work. It might have been expected that Sofaradi's perspective on women would have been influenced by that of his famous Sufi uncle, Abul Najib, Abul Najib Sofi Rabadi, who died in 1168. Abul Najib famously declared that in our times, it is better to avoid marriage. However, his nephew, Abu Hafs, had a perspective that was not negative, but it was at best cautious about marriage and women. At the beginning of his chapter, he warns of spiritual wayfare that there must, be, uh, there, must, uh, there must be no hurry in taking a wife. And he cites the view of Sahla Tussari, who said, A calamity befalls a capable student when he marries. They say that she is a deficiency, a naqsa, and defilement, a hadath, of men. However, Sofaradi did not discuss his issue, as it seems his concern lay in two other areas. The first was with the economic difficulties that faced men once they had additional responsibilities, that is a wife or wives, and children. The second major concern for Sofaradi was with sex. But it is of interest that he did not portray women as lustful or instigating the downfall of men, as Menesi reads in, in uh, Ghazali. Rather, for Sarawadi, the fault lay within men themselves. He offered a number of sayings from past masters whose comments reveal their favorable attitude towards sex, including Janaid, which we've already um, discussed. And he also referred to Sufyan Thauri, who observed that Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was described as one of the most ascetic of the uh, early camp companions, had four wives and 17 concubines. So that's the, uh, the, um, the literature relating to the Sufi manuals. I want to move now on to how they are um, portrayed in other forms of literature, including hagiographies and uh, maybe some forms of um, some poetry too. The presence of female Sufis most likely challenged the complementarity model that some had read into the Quran and which also legitimized male authority based upon the Quran, chapter 4, verse 3. The presence of females disturbed those who were inclined towards a more ascetic lifestyle that was emergent at this time, in response to the belief that the Sufi movement was becoming stale and ossified as a result of its popularization and patronage from rulers. The fear among Sufis and philosophers of a Gnostic persuasion that linked females with sexuality is graphically illustrated by Shams al Tabrizi, died in 1248, or maybe disappeared in 1248, who alluded to the feminine gender, gender of the Arabic word for soul, or nafs. He says, The soul has the nature of a woman, or rather, woman herself has the nature of the soul. To clarify his argument, he then cited the hadith, consult with them, with women, then oppose them. The 13th century hagiographer Aflaki also reported that Shams al Tabrizi was virulent in his rejection of the possibility of female spirituality. Here we have a trigger warning. In Glasgow University now we have trigger warnings. So if anyone's sensitive, you better leave the room. <laughs> so. One day, Molana Shams al Din was describing virtuous women and their chastity. He said, But despite all this, if a woman were given a place above the celestial throne, and her sight suddenly lighted on the world, and she saw an erect penis on the earth's surface, 
Like a mad woman, she would fling herself down and land on top of it because in their religion, there is nothing higher than this. You can all come back now. <laughs> Shams's dislike for female sexuality may be related to the possibility that he had sympathies for Galandaz, who become infamous in the Islamic world for shaving away their facial and head hair. It is related that a founder of the Galandaz, Jamal ad-Din Sowi, was trapped in the house of a certain woman who had desired him for some time. In an attempt to escape, Jamal ad-Din shaved his face and head, making himself unattracted so that she would leave him in peace. The connection between untrammeled sexuality and impiety is obvious, and Sufi literature frequently compared an old, ugly woman who dressed in beautiful clothes and made herself attractive to the world in which we live, which was ephemeral and nothing but a trap. As argued by Mernessy, the associations made of, of dangerously active female sexuality and the perception of their inferior intellects must have contributed to males promoting and enforcing the segregation of women. Indeed, this is precisely the principle that had been advocated by Ghazali, who cited a hadith which advised women that their rightful occupation is staying at home and engaging in female activities such as spinning. Again, Shams al Tabrizi, with a clear nod to the same hadith, remarked, and I quote, it's best that a woman sits behind the spindle in the corner of her house, busy in the service of the one who takes care of her. The kinds of views cited above rest upon a perspective that is based upon the Quranic command that women were to be protected by their husbands, fathers, and brothers. A woman of marriageable age who did not have such a male guardian was in an undesirable position. It might be for this reason that insults in Persian were frequently couched in terms of female immorality. Jalaluddin Rumi, known as one of the greatest wordsmiths in the Persian language, reflected this tendency as he had a penchant for exclaiming, your mother's a whore. This insult appears in not just one of his quatrains, but indeed it appears in similar kind of expressions such as, your sister's a whore. According to Aflaki, this was uttered by Rumi whenever he was angry. And he added that it was an expression of abuse employed by those from Khorasan. <laughs> But it's not in an innocent expression, as Rumi lived and breathed within the Islamic Persianate cultural context of the medieval period, which endorsed complementarity and segregation, and in which male honor was frequently understood with reference to control and care over the females in the family. The deficiency of the female intellect was the justification for men to act as guardians over women in Persian society during this period which at times led to the abuse of a structure that at best provided some degree of security and stability for women. However, its worst manifestations resulted in degrada degradation and humiliation. An example once more is provided by Aflaki, who has Shams al Tabrizi asking Rumi for a good looking person or a shah head. Rumi offered his own wife, but Shams refused and asked for a boy. Rumi then offered Shams his son, Sultan Walad, and even brought some wine from the Jewish quarter when asked to do so. For Shams, this was a test designed to assess the limits of Rumi's forbearance. Now, this anecdote may have some basis in fact, for Rumi himself wrote, what the sheikh pre prescribes for you is the same as what the sheikhs of old prescribed, that you leave your wife and children, your wealth and position. Indeed, they used to prescribe for a disciple, leave your wife that we may take her, and they put up with that. So, that's what we find in terms of uh, some of the uh, information we get from hagiographies. In terms of female Sufi practice, again, I'd like to lead off with Shams. He's a great hero of mine. Shams' dislike of women is also confirmed in a report which confirms that some female Sufis were acting as Sufi sheikhs. As he stated, if Fatima or Aisha had acted as sheikhs, I would have lost my belief in the messenger. That there were shakers in Anatolia in the time when Shams was alive is very likely, as Aflaki reports that the daughters of Salahuddin Zakub, one of Rumi's principal followers, were both ladies endowed with miracles and friendship of God. Most of the ladies of the realms of Rum turned to them and became their disciples. Moreover, Ibn Arabi mentions several female teachers, one of whom used to tell him, I am your spiritual mother and the light of your carnal mother. And he in turn referred to her 
as a mercy for the world, a term, of course, most commonly used for Muhammad. The horror of Shams al Tabrizi to the possibility of female shakers was matched by the Moroccan jurist Muhammad ibn Hajj, who died in 1336, who decried against those in Mamluk Egypt who are called shakers. And he railed against, he, sorry, he railed throughout his work against any acti activity in which women were not silent, invisible, and subservient to men. The female shaker, says Ibn Hajj, was also an interpreter of God's book. She relates stories of prophets, adds and deletes often committing blatant blasphemies. From the 12th century onwards, there are reports of female khanagars or convents, where activities were administered by women themselves. For example, Umm Zainab Fatima bin Tabas, who was active in the uh, 13th century, was the sheikh of the so-called Baghdadi Aribat in Cairo, which had been established in 1285. In addition to the Ribat al-Baghdadiya, Jonathan Berge has noted that five others were set up for women in Cairo during the Mamluk period, in addition to a number of other similar institutions outside of the city in the necropolis. Reports of other lodges for women from the mid-12th century show that provision existed in Aleppo, Baghdad, Damascus, where one female shaker, if we are to believe this hagiography, was responsible for 17 khanagars. In spite of the paradigm for segregation and complementarity, there is sufficient evidence to show that women were constantly challenging what was deemed permissible. Aflaki reports that Kira Khartoun, the second wife of Jalaluddin Rumi, and some other ladies wished to see a group of Rifai Sufis in a local madrasa one day. Uh, she did this without, without Rumi's permission, which provoked his fury when she returned later in the day. Aflaki implies that Rumi forgave her and ensured that she would not be punished in the hereafter, but she suffered physically as her body became cold or maybe paralyzed for the rest of her days. As a result of this incident, and I quote, she never came outside except evenings when she went to the bathhouse. This should not be regarded as an isolated incident of females desiring to attend Sufi meetings and taking the initiative to, to attend such gatherings. There is a story in the hagiography of Sheikh Ohad al-Din Kemani which describes some female Sufis flocking to a Samar session with male Sufis, which caused the intense dis displeasure of Kemani's leading disciple Zain al-Din Sadaqa. Opposition to female engagement in Sufism appeared within the second class Sufi organizations which emerged in the 13th century, that is the Futuwal or Java Mahdi groups, which by this time had mushroomed across the Persian and Turkish speaking world. The manuals of these groups stipulated that women could not join. The literal meaning of the term Futuwat is indicative of the problem, as it means manliness, being derived from the Arabic word fata or young man. The origins of these organizations in part in part lay in groups of brigands, or AR, who had lofty ethical views, and as such, the martial aspect and heritage of these groups may have been the motivation for men to join and, the, and to discourage females from any interest in what they were doing. So, I guess I'm running out of time, so I'll conclude. There's plenty of evidence to indicate that women were continually attempting to create space for themselves and engage in Sufi forms of piety. The opposition to female Sufis or to female participation in Sufi-style devotions came from both non-Sufis and also male Sufis, such as Shams. And this was not simply directed at women leading Sufi gatherings, which might also have meant women enjoying positions of authority over men, but it was also due to the male fear of untrammeled female sexuality and the belief that they were deficient in, the, in their intellectual makeup. It is quite remarkable that for approximately 300 years, there was no female Sufi author composing poetry or writing a manual or being the subject of a single hagiography. The only information about Sufis or female Sufis that comes to hand is that which was composed by men. The other point to mention, and one which unfortunately, as I said, I have no time to, to discuss, concerns how some Sufis idealize the feminine to the extent that they spoke of God or manifestations of God as women. The problem, however, is that such works do not reveal sufficient information about the social reality of women and how their forms of Sufism were expressed. But it's clear that researchers should not be myopic about the position of women in society. And clearly there is a need to move on from Rabia 
and face the reality that during this middle period of Islamic history, women were all too often neglected and denied space and a voice within a Sufi tradition to practice their faith in spiritual lives. Thank you. The work that you mentioned by Asolami, which you gave the title Worshipping Sufi Women, uh -huh. what was the um, uh, original title in the... <laughs> it's just it's a bit ambiguous the way it's put like that. No, it's not. It's got this one in the title. Yeah. I, I can't remember. It could be this one, uh, 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 or, or something. Oh, right. My talk, I'm talking about it, but it's Fantastic. Like, Uh -huh. okay. um, and another point I wanted to make is about the terminology used in this e extremely interesting quote of Attar about she cannot be called a woman when a woman is a man on the path of the Lord. She cannot be called a woman. And I wondered what the word for man is there. I, I checked the original, it's mild. It is, yep. yeah. Because in, in the chemia, Al Ghazali would use insan, uh, which is a much better word mm. than man. Absolutely. And uh, apropos Ghazali, in the book of marriage, um, he does give a lot of very um, favorable comments about how you can, if you possibly can, satisfy your wife sexually, which is not the um, um, attitude of a misogynist. It's quite modern in its way. I suppose so. I mean, you can certainly read it like that. But uh, I, I personally am not um, convinced by Fatima Manissi's arguments anyway. I think there are a lot of reasons that we can, we can attribute to his other negative perspectives relating to women. And I think well, one of the interesting perspectives is given by um, Omid Safi uh, in, in his work, in one of his chapters, in which he says there's a lot of internal politics going on. And Ghazali was in, in the payroll, if you like, of Nizam al Malk, who was favoring a certain son of, of the caliph, as opposed to the, the favored wife, who wanted somebody else to, to take over the, the caliphate. So there are a lot of reasons that we can perhaps contribute to, to this discussion about Ghazali's view on, on women. And just one more point, apropos Nizam al Malk, mm. is that the whole mirrors for princes' literature is worth looking there for attitudes, yeah. not just to Sufi women, but to women. Yeah. And uh, it's deeply influenced by the invasion of these nasty, nomadic, bossy Turkish uh -huh, mothers. Uh -huh. Oh, really? OK. <laughs> <laughs> but can I, can I just come back to you on, on, on this point? I think a lot of what you said is, is really, really useful. And one of the points that, one of the reasons that I decided to undertake the whole of this project, looking at these marginal Sufi groups, was because I went down to London oh, many, many years ago now, and uh, I gave a presentation uh, about the theme of Javan Mahdi. And it was very, very interesting for me is, is that uh, it was quite a, a large gathering, maybe 100 people, the majority of whom were, were women, women. And all they were concerned about were, was what Sufism says about women. And I said, well, what do you know about Sufi women? And the only thing that they could reply with was Rabia. There's an obsession with Rabia. But then, you know, what happens after Rabia? There's just silence. There's nothing at all. Well, Baldick thinks she might even be a creation of somebody's imagination, that she didn't really exist. <laughs> well, but, I mean, as you probably know, I mean, the, the information that we have about Rabia was written by men. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Last question for this one. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. I may ask you uh, to show once again uh, Al Ghazali slide. The uh, one on Ghazali? Oh. This one, yes. Okay. Uh, this citation, as far as I guess, uh, is taken from Nasihat al Muluk. Yes. The second part. Yes. yes. The last sentence. Yes. It doesn't belong to him. This doesn't belong to Ghazali. It doesn't belong to this part, the second part. C can you elaborate on that? Yes, sure. <laughs> Maybe later. <laughs> There's a big literature on that by Kroger and me. Ah, uh -huh, okay, thank you. Actually, I appreciate that, which in itself is quite interesting because it still shows the kind of perspectives that were prevalent in this age. It may not come from Ghazali, but in some ways it doesn't really matter because it's indicative of the kind of mentality.
especially uh, uh, take precautions in matters of choosing wives mm. and giving daughters in marriage. Mm. There is uh, missing, uh, especially a grown-up daughter. Uh -huh. okay. That makes it a little, little bit better. <coughs> well, thank you.